here's a story from 13th century Japan of a monastery attendant named Kiyono. And she was a, a peasant and didn't know how to read or write and yet had immense faith. And one day she went up to one of the nuns and said, I don't know if I'm able to, to practice. You know, can I also realize I don't have an education? I can't read or write. And the nun said, this is the beautiful part about the Dhamma is all beings are equal in its eyes. And if you turn your mind towards the source of unwholesome phenomena, you can watch them cease. This is the heart of Zazen. Something like that. And the monastery attendant was heartened and gave herself to this practice of every day while she carried out her tasks and her chores, uh, haul water, chop wood, all that. She kept this constant vig vigilance over the mind. And after several months, she was hauling water from the well on a full moon night in an old bamboo bucket uh, covered or uh, bound together with wire. And the reflection of the moon was in the water and suddenly the wires frayed or came undone and the bottom of the bucket dropped out and the moon disappeared, the reflection. And this was her initiation to uh, an awakening experience. And the verses she uttered then were something along the lines of bound together by various things, I've held together this bucket. But when all those things come undone and the water drops away, the moon also disappears. And this idea of awakening as the unwinding of the wires and piece together thing we've tried to bind into a coherent, cohesive self, an entity that we can control and satisfy through the years from childhood until now, the idea that awakening comes from their sudden untying and the understanding that the image of the moon we've been staring at in that water is nothing. And that actually we've been looking in the exact opposite direction of the moon, that the moon is up above and only when our fixation with that shivering and fragile image is dispersed, does the mind turn towards awakening. And what is beyond this piece together sense of the self. And you hear this often in the suttas, is once a monastic or a practitioner begins to let go of the various subjective identifiers or symbols of the identity, the Buddha encourages them, turn your mind towards the deathless element. Turn your mind towards the moon. And yet the first step in that process is to unwind this contraption of wires and bamboo slits and pieces of identity we've tried to cobble together into something which we feel 
will last, which will satisfy us, which we can protect, the sense of self. And it's not that when that's let go of, we become blank automatons. It's rather that there's an agility and a levity. Uh, Ajahn Chah would say, look, you know, I still hold things, but I hold them lightly. And you know when to put them down. And the cobbled together piece or contraption that the Buddha spoke about um, of the self, he delineated into five parts, the khandas is what we call them. And this framework for how to identify and uh, unravel that sense of self which is so solid when it's looked at in its uh, unexamined state. The ability to parse it out and to untangle the skein of wires and uh, various pieces we've bound together is a key part of the practice. And it formed the basis of the Buddha's second discourse, the Analakana Sutta, Anatalakana Sutta, the discourse on not self, where he spoke to the five practitioners or ascetics who had practiced with him before his awakening. And he said, uh, Is form permanent? or impermanent, and they said impermanent, Lord, is what is impermanent suffering or happiness? And they said suffering, Lord. It's insubstantial. It's not satisfactory. Is what is insubstantial, unsatisfactory, worthy to call, this is me, this is myself, this is mine? No, venerable sir. He said, bhikkhus, if form were self, one would be able to say of form, that's the body. Let my form, let my body be thus. Let my body not be thus. But because bhikkhus, form is not self, one is not able to say, let my form be thus, let my form not be thus. And seeing rightly, one becomes disenchanted with the body, disenchanted with form. And he goes on and does the same with the other four aggregates. So aggregate means heap. Um, it can in indicate a heap of flame. So these signifiers of identity that burn on dependence uh, on our craving. And also just these elements of experience we attach to. The Buddha didn't have a word for experience. Experience is the five khandas. And these aggregates of clinging include form, the body, rupa, feeling, or affective tone, uh, pleasant, painful, or neutral, vedana, sanya, cognition or perception. So this is our uh, how we identify objects in our experience, how a sense impression comes in and we label it blue or red or purple. It's kind of sifting through our memory banks and applying a mental label to an impression. There's sankara, formations. And these are the mental programs we run uh, that mix together all the other khandas, all the other aggregates into cohesive experience. Um, and also the element of impulse or intention. And then you have vinyana, consciousness. And this is what holds and experiences all these other khandas. And the Buddha said that the first four khandas are what he called name and form, nama rupa. So you have rupa, the body, and then you have the mental elements dependent on the body. So you have vedana, the feeling. So you see a, a, a sight or hear a sound and feel pleasant, painful, neutral. You have perception where you identify something. And then you have sankara, these... Um, mental programs and formations in our minds, our impulses. 
And he said, this is name and form. And these building blocks of experience, which seem so solid when you aren't examining them, vinyana, consciousness, takes, and it pieces them together like a weaver into a cohesive, continuous sense of self. Vinyana is the piece of that identity that says, I am experiencing, I am walking, I am tasting, I am feeling, I am the body. And so these different khandas lean against each other, they're dependent. The Buddha spoke about name and form and consciousness leaning against one another, they're like two bundles of reeds. They're each dependent on one another. And together they form a vortex. And if you think about a tornado, it looks solid, but there's nothing at the center. It's a swirling mass of dust and wind and motion. And yet at its center, it's empty. It's calm. It's still. So this is about finding the eye at the center of the storm, about seeing through that vortex of wind that we take as so substantial and seeing beyond it. And how we identify with these, the sense of self that we attribute to these aggregates. Um, the Buddha spoke about three ways we identify with an aggregate. Either we say etang mama, which means this is mine. And that word mama, the first word that a baby will say, mama, mine, mother. Um, there's something very primal about that, but we either try to own the aggregate um, or we say, Eso asmi, this is my, me, the sense of subtle self that forms in the shadow of experience. Or eso me atati, this is myself, I, explicit identification with an aggregate. And these aren't well articulated philosophical assumptions in our cognition, but rather this kind of underlying way of thinking about what self means. Because as soon as we see with a clear mind, the body doesn't obey me. When I'm sick, it won't do what I want. It ages, it gets sick, it does its own thing, whether or not I command it to do that. There's a sense of unlinking in the heart of like, oh, that's not me. It's not me. That sense of self dissolves just a little bit. And that distinction between clinging tightly to these aggregates is all we have versus slowly seeing through them and rele releasing our grip just a little bit allows the heart to rest more and more in a spacious brightness which is beyond all of them. And the Buddha didn't articulate what was beyond those aggregates except to say it's nibbana, it's awakening, and it's a good thing. You should try to get there but it's beyond words. So he didn't try to go into detail because we would just reconceptualize it. We would try to recognize it. We would make it into the aggregates again. There's a beautiful sutta where uh, a monk named Venerable Kemika is on his deathbed and a monk, the senior monks nearby send a messenger and the messenger says, Venerable Kemika, we know you're sick and uh, in pain. Uh, do, does your body hurt right now? Are you unwell? And he says, I am unwell. And the messenger runs back to the senior monks and says, he's, he's unwell. And then the senior monks send the messenger back and the messenger says, Venerable Chemica, the seniors want me to ask, do you identify with any of these aggregates? And Venerable Chemica says, no, I don't. And so the messenger runs back to the senior monks and reports that. And then he comes back to Venerable Chemica and says, Venerable Chemica, the senior monks want me to ask, are you awakened yet, since you identify not with the aggregates? And Venerable Chemica says, no, I'm not. And the messenger runs back. And this goes back and forth until finally Venerable Chemica says, OK, enough. And he gets up, despite being sick, and walks over to the senior monks and says, even though I don't explicitly identify with any of these aggregates as me or mine or myself, even so I am not yet awakened. It's as if like a flower. You can't say of that flower, 
the scent comes from the stem or the stamen or the petals, but nonetheless, a scent still lingers. And even so, though I've given up an explicit identification with any of these aggregates, still this subtle sense of self remains. And the listeners became awakened, and Venerable Kemika gained the distinction of becoming the one bhikkhu to ever become awakened from his own Dharma talk. <laughs> so, so as we let go of these aggregates, the first level is letting go of this sense of clinging as mine and saying explicitly, this is myself. And that happens at stream entry. One who's seen awakening, whose heart has contacted the deathless, the dimension beyond birth and death, can never again truly believe that this body is them, that these perceptions are them, that this consciousness is all they are because they've seen something beyond. But even after that first stage of awakening, still this subtle sense of self lingers. And the last fetter, one of them to be given up at Arhanship, full awakening, is Asmi Mana, that subtle conceit of self. And that's the final relinquishment of the scent of that subtle self that hides in the background. So how we gain disenchantment, how we move towards that sense of awakening is by naming our experience, by parsing it out with these five aggregates so we no longer take it as a cohesive whole. And this is how you use this practice is in your meditations, in your daily life, when you experience any of these, can you examine it as such and unravel the cloth of experience? With the body, um, the Buddha compared it to a lump of foam floating down a river. And even so, it's insubstantial. We take it as a solid thing, but if you examine the body closely, and this is the sub subjective experience of the body. How does it feel? What is it, what's the internal sense of it? As you examine it, you notice uh, it changes. The external manifestation of it changes. It doesn't obey us. And the Buddha has so many contemplations aimed at seeing this. But just this constant being with the body and seeing how it's always shifting, um, how it's composed of many parts, just like that lump of foam is composed of many bubbles, how it's not worth taking as a self. It's changing. Are you the same as you were when you were a child? Are you the same as you were seven years ago? Every cell in your body is replaced every seven years. Is this really you and yours and yourself? And when the mind sees that clearly, with a calm groundedness born of concentration, it lets go. The next aggregate is feeling, Vedana. And this has been difficult to translate into English because it's not emotion, but it's the hedonic tone. It's the immediate sense of pleasure or pain or neutral feeling that we experience. And the Buddha compared Vedana to the bubble of water that forms on the surface of a pool when a raindrop drop hits it. So as with all these analogies, there's such depth to that. When a sense impression hits, immediately the reaction is feeling. I don't like, I like, or boredom. I, this doesn't really affect me. And that idea of the water bubble, um, its insubstantiality lets us not get caught up and identify so quickly with Vedana. And feeling Vedana is an essential link on the chain of dependent origination, which is a psychological process that leads to suffering. Vedana comes and we, it's so primal that we immediately react often with craving to get away or to move towards. And only if we bring mindfulness to bear at that moment and say, oh, this is pleasant feeling 
or this is painful, can we stop that chain from moving on? Can we parse out that thread and let it unravel before it leads to further weaving of this cloth of suffering, of self? In Vedna, it hits so deep sometimes, it's very hard not to identify with. When the person we don't like walks into the room, that sense of sinking, of nausea, or when the person we love or are enamored with walks into the room, that sense of uplift and brightness, can we see how we become drunk on that so quickly, how we grasp it as mind, etang mama, how we grasp it as me, it's intoxicating. And you know that if you tie your heart to the water bubble, the water bubble will fade and the heart will encounter once again that emptiness that comes when the aggregate falls away. None of these aggregates are solid, they are processes. The Buddha was a radical phenomenologist. Everything is a process. This is why the aggregates translated as heaps of flame is almost the best translation because it implies their motion and their movement. Another really important way of looking at Vedana feeling is illustrated in the Majjhima Nikaya 44 or where a nun named Venerable Damadina says, pleasant feeling is pleasant when it remains and painful when it changes. Painful feeling is painful when it remains and pleasant when it changes. Neutral feeling is unpleasant when experienced without awareness and pleasant when experienced with awareness. And this idea that pleasure and pain are two sides of the same coin. As soon as you get drunk on one, you know the other will come. And this just lets you see through feeling, Vedna, and not attach. The next aggregate the Buddha spoke about was sanya, perception, cognition. And the Buddha spoke about this as the perception of blue, red, or other colors. This idea that a sense impression comes and you identify it, identify with it. And in an analogy that one famous monk gives, sanya is compared to the ring finger because when you buy into a perception, you bind yourself to it. It's very solid. It solidifies the experience. Your boss walks in and there's that who you're having a difficult time with. And there's the immediate sinking feeling of Vedana. But then there's also this sense of, oh, him. And that identification and, uh, you know, that word like, what a jerk, something like that. The whole process is initiated through sanya, and suddenly things are very solid. In the Madhupindika Sutta, um, there's a pro the Buddha outlines that progression of experience where he says, what one feels, one per or when there is sight and mental consciousness, there is percept feeling. What one, with feeling, there is perception. What one perceives, one thinks about. And the fact that the personal pronoun enters with perception, that solidification of the external solidifies the internal as well. That's where the self forms in the shadow. So seeing perception, and the Buddha compares perception to a mirage. He says, it's insubstantial, even though we take it as so solid and see through it. The fourth khanda is sankhara, or formations. And the Buddha spoke about sankhara as, this is the most complicated term, but it's the concoctor, the concoction, and the act of concocting. So it's Sankara, in one sutta, the Buddha says, Sankara creates form for the sake of formness. It creates feeling for the sake of feelingness. It creates perception for the sake of perceptionness. It creates creation for the sake of creationness. It creates consciousness for the sake of consciousness. 
that doesn't quite work as well, but you know. So the idea that Sankar is the cook, it's taking all these ingredients and binding them together. So when your boss walks in, you might notice that a feeling comes up of a sinking feeling. The perception of jerk comes in, and the word maybe. And a memory comes up, and then a sense of shivering in your body or trepidation, and then a proliferation on what you're going to do. This is all the mass of Sankara arising. And the Buddha said that Sankara is like a plantain. And plantain trees are, you can look for heartwood, but there's none. You just unwrap them, and they're one big sheath that you unravel. And at the center, there's nothing. It's like an onion. That's our Western equivalent. You just unwrap Sankara, and there's nothing in the center. It just looks solid because it's a tangled skein. It looks cohesive. And Sankara is also the intention and impulse to act, chetana, and the sense of identification with that. And finally, there's vinyana, consciousness. And this is the subtle weaver behind it all that thinks, I am experiencing this, that takes all those four building blocks and weaves them together into a sense of self that's solid and enduring and seems substantial. The Buddha compared Sankara to a magician. It sits at the crossroads, and these different impressions come by, and it creates and conjures a mirage or a, a trick, but it's just that. And the way you can work with these is, first, Longpur Sumedha would often say, whenever one of these comes up, whenever you have an experience, say, who is it that's walking? Who is feeling? Who is seeing? And just let that question echo and unravel the tangle. Uh, he also said that you or Ajahn Jayasara recommends whenever one of these impressions or constituents of experience arises, you can just look at it as impermanent. Notice how it changes. Notice how feeling shifts so quickly. You don't know what you're going to think in the next 10 seconds. How is that you? You know, how, what delusion that we buy into this is the self. And just to make note of that again and again. To, and you can even do this by when a strong thought process is moving through you to say, and that's anicca, that's impermanent. Just tag that phrase onto the end, and that's anicca, and that's impermanent. I really want a cup of coffee, and that's anicca, that's impermanent. With perception, notice how your perception of a loved one changes within a day even. They're the enemy, they're the loved one. There's a beautiful story of a Zen monk named Wonho in 6th century AD who was going to the Tang China, traveling to study uh, the teachings there. And he got caught in a rainstorm and in the dark of the night stumbled into a cave for shelter. And he found, you know, he was parched and found a gourd of cool water, which he drank and sated himself and fell asleep. He woke up the next morning and found out that he'd actually stumbled into a crypt. And the, two, the gourd was an empty skull filled with uh, rank water. And this knowledge of how much his perception had been shifted in that moment issued into his awakening. And he said... Impressions are born of the mind. When the mind ceases, when thought ceases, a tomb and a cave are one. When all dharmas arise in the mind, why do I need to go to st elsewhere to study them? I will not go to the tong. When there is no thought, mind and a tomb are one. So perception. When is your loved one a skeleton, when are they a cool gourd of water? And just see how that shifts. These things are a mirage.
And really how we use this is just the ability to untangle that sense of self, that tangled cloth, and paint yourself into a corner with it. So identify throughout your day each element of experience as one or another of these, and they're conjoined. The Buddha said that these things bleed into each other. So it's not like there's a clear line between consciousness and perception and feeling. They all arise together. But can you name each until you've cornered yourself and suddenly the mind breaks open the bucket and looks elsewhere? Because you see that one way of articulating the practice is you see that everything is a guest until finally you turn your attention to the host. So the condors are a way of taking what you thought was the host, the self that's hiding in the shadow, and noticing all of it's just the guests, all of it is not you. And eventually, when that happens, you no longer can identify with it. And the mind can look up to the sky where the moon is waiting. So uh, good luck with all of that. Yes. <laughs> Andamayang Dhammakataya Sadhu Karang Dharma Say Sadhu 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 Anumodami I forgot to mention one great sutta where there's a king and he hears the sound of a lute so lovely, so pleasant. And he says, minister, what is that sound so lovely, so pleasant? Bring me that sound. And the minister says, uh, I'll bring you the lute, but I can't bring you just the sound. The sound arises in dependence on this constituents of parts, namely the soundboard, the fretboard, the strings. And so the king, taking the lute, would smash it and burn it into a bunch of pieces and ash and scatter the ash in the water. And he would say, what is this thing called a lute which the world is so taken with? Even so, bhikkhus, when you've investigated these five aggregates to their very end, you can find nothing there to take as a self, me, or mine. So this idea that the self is this subtle melody we really think is substantial. But when we take apart the lute, we find the sound doesn't exist without the lute. And that's not to say all that's left is silence, but when you put down that sound, what remains is, you know, something else, a different and deeper and profound silence beyond time. Um, and I, I love that sutta. So, so we have time for some questions now. Uh, if people want to raise their hand, then you can say your name and. Uh, if you're on Zoom, feel free to raise your electronic hand. Hi. Um, this is going to be a little bit of an open-ended question, but just based on my understanding and my practice, I feel like a lot of meditation is like a deconstruction of your phenomenal reality. Like emotion turns into sensations. Um, beliefs turn into stories. And things turn into emptiness. But it's very hard to operate, at least in lay life, with a deconstructed reality where like everything feels like phenomenal experiences, like individual things, and there's no like story to tie it all together. I feel like in uh, monastic life or on retreat, it's fine because there is a structure to keep that together, and you can move past it and reconstruct it in a way that's skillful. But um, I have trouble, especially if like my meditation goes really deep, of that reconstruction process where I just feel like I'm crazy in a way. <laughs> so it is an open-ended question. Like, what would you recommend, at least in lay life, of like when that process happens, when it does untangle, like the retangling has to happen to operate in day-to-day -day life? It's a good question. I'd say this is one of the really important things about forms. Um, people can look at uh, schedules and ritual as outdated superstition, etc. But 
they really hold and frame the practice in an important way. Because you're right, like, as the meditations deepen, often there can be phases where things can feel very ungrounded because you are deconstructing a lot. So to have a community you're checking in with, um, to have, you know, some clear guidelines and schedules so you have the five precepts, to have a schedule for your day, like this is the time I meditate, I bow at these times. Um, those forms are, are actually quite meaningful and, and increasingly so. I'd say another thing is to note that the Noble Eightfold Path, the Buddha divided into three sections. There's sila, which is ethics. There's samadhi, concentration. And then there's panya, wisdom. And panya, wisdom, is the part that unravels everything. It sees everything as khandas. But that can only coexist when there's sila and samadhi holding a bright mind that you can rest in beyond those khandas. Um, or not beyond the khandas, but that can hold the mind um, when it's letting go of what it's known before. Um, Ajahn Mahabua said, when you think in terms of sila and samadhi, you think in terms of self. So sila would be like, this is, I'm an honest person, I'm a giving person. Every day I do this, every week I go to the soup kitchen once, I treat people this way. And there's this deep, wholesome sense of self. And you're right, we're still weaving a self, but it's made of wholesome strands. And a huge part of life is replacing the junk food with the health food. Um, and that takes a long time because health food doesn't taste as good at first. <laughs> so, but it does, it tastes better in the long run. You know, it's like exchanging a greasy piece of chicken for fresh snow, you know. It's not the best analogy. <laughs> a salad, I don't know. Um, it takes a while, though. Um, and then samadhi is the cultivation of this bright mind and that, you know, Longpur Suchitta says 80% of the practice at the beginning is just letting the chitta grow brighter, and that happens through meditation. And, and that's really important because there can be this idea that when you let go of that, when you're untangling stuff, you're not left with anything underneath, but alongside that sense of letting go, there should be this sense of intuitive awareness guiding you more and more. The sense of like, oh, this is wrong, this is right, like a deeper voice which leads you. And, and that's really important to let, let grow as well. So you shouldn't be without guidance in that, in that sense. It just takes a while to hear that quiet voice. Um, so yeah, I'd say that like, if you're in deep retreat, just make sure it's really structured and give yourself time to re-enter and let the cloth weave itself again. Um, because during deep retreat, that stuff really can fall apart. So you don't want to have decisions. It just needs to be all scheduled often. But then in daily life, you know, rely on these other structures about one day a week you hold for practice and hold the eight precepts. You hold the five precepts, you know. You, you have spiritual friends, like help hold yourself through that deconstruction process as much as you can. So, and, and also use meditations of loving kindness that kind of brightens the chitta that will hold your heart. So just doing vipassana, insight meditation, or just goenka, sometimes can be a lot for people because it's like all, all about deconstruction, which can be hard. So you need to balance that with samatha. Yeah, does that help a bit? Uh, you don't look too crazy yet, Samek. <laughs> you got some time. <laughs> okay. Axel, oh. Steve think, or Axel, please. I think I'm next. Yeah, uh, could you um, could you discern between uh, panya and chitta? Because it seems they almost seem the same sort of, and and especially the latter chitta. It seems like it's really easy to think that's me. Uh, I mean, it's like the hardest thing to not think there's a me there. So, kind of, can you tease that apart? Yeah. <laughs> So chitta and vijnana, chitta means heart-mind, and it's used pretty synonymously with vijnana, consciousness, the fifth aggregate. And the question is, how is that different than wisdom, panya? And this, the Buddha actually, I think it's Venerable Sariputta, addresses this directly. He says, 
consciousness, vijnana, knows pleasure, this is ple pleasant, this is painful, or this is suffering. Wisdom knows this is dukkha, this is the source of dukkha, this is the cessation of dukkha, this is the path to the cessation of dukkha. So there's a relation there in that vijnana does know suffering, but wisdom's almost this refinement of it that knows even more. And I've heard the analogy is it's like vijnana is like a child who sees a coin and it knows it's metal and shiny. Perception, sanya, knows uh, the worth of the coin. It knows that it's a coin. It knows how much the denomination. Wisdom is like a treasurer who knows, uh, is this actual gold? When was it minted? Uh, what can I use it for? How does it fit into other denominations? So they are related, I'd say. And from what I know, people compare chitta to a lake. And when it's quivering, it is rippling and unclear. And vijnana can be unclear. But as it settles and calms, the surface of the lake becomes smooth and perfectly reflective and sees clearly, and that's wisdom. So it is hidden there. And you're right, it is related. But as to exactly when one ceases and the other begins, or how that sense of Russian nesting dolls works, you know, I think the Buddha just said, look, there, they are related, and you want to refine consciousness more and more. And as you kind of step back through that consciousness, release again and again and again, you move towards full awakening. But as soon as you name what you step into in any substantive way, you risk stopping short of the end goal. It reminds me of an anthropologist who went to this tribe and said, um, you know, what does the earth rest on? And they said, well, the earth rests on a turtle. And he said, well, okay, what is that turtle standing on? And they said, it's on another turtle. And he said, well, what? And they said, look, it's turtles all the way down. <laughs> so, so for me, the Buddha was a pragmatist. He wasn't giving us an ontological perfect framework. He was giving us a, like, a methodology for breaking open this bind of samsara. And he gave us enough for that. But yeah, I, I always ask that, that question too, and I never get a perfectly answer I understand either. I think there's a point to that. Can, can you just follow on that one bit just about you know, the trickiness about, especially a citta, you know, heart, mind, and sort of resting in that and thinking that is somehow I. I mean, that's just yeah. so, because it's not, and it seems like it, more than anything. Yeah, yeah and this is the Buddha's, um, you know, so this is an experience people have, is the mind gets calm and suddenly there's a radiance and a self-contained nature to the, the mind. And, I mean, consciousness becomes very salient, and it's so hard not to identify with that and take it as God or the bodhicitta. And that's why the Buddha just gave us a strategy in the end of see dukkha and let go of it. So in every one of those cases, he just said, keep applying the Four Noble Truths, where is there any sense of disease? Is there any sense of movement in that mind? And there's a story of Longtam Mahabua in the end of his practice. He's a famous teacher in Thailand. He came to this radiant center. And his practice for numerous days was just watching it and seeing if there's any movement. And suddenly he saw there was this slight shift. And then his mind broke open to something entirely different. So I'd say, yeah, the, the Buddha recognized the danger. In, he gave us something to move towards. But then in the end of the day, there's only dukkha and the cessation of dukkha, and that is enough of a springboard to get you to awakening, hopefully. <laughs> so, I think so. Thank you, Steve. Axel. Hello. Um, so, I wanted to ask about, like, um, getting rid of bad things uh, in yourself, I suppose. Um, I've never really had issues with not identifying with my physical body. Uh, I remember having issues with even recognizing myself from a child, um, from a child age, whatever, sorry. <laughs> um, but I have been noticing that I have a lot of issues with, um, like, I recognize that things are bad 
Um, but as somebody who's dealt with bad for most of my life, it's hard for me to discern what is good in comparison um, and which supposedly negative traits can help me and how to like isolate those. Um, I've tried compassion meditation, but I'm kind of a, a bit out of whack for that right now. So do you have any other recommendations? Yeah, that's a good one. I think the first, yes, like looking at the negative constructs with as the five khandas and seeing their illusory nature, that's useful. But then you're right, like how if you've been operating in that realm for so long, how do you gain any sense of, of what's different and let go into that and have trust that there's something there to catch you if you do? And this is one of the reasons we don't let go of dukkha is it's familiar. Like Ajahn Jeff says, the last thing you can take from people is their suffering. Um, and I'd say that is just a slow process of, in the Kalama Sutta, the Buddha says to a group of villagers who are really doubtful about what path to take, he says, first, do you believe actions taken from greed, hatred, and delusion lead to suffering or benefit? And they say, leads to suffering. Um, and, and basically he says, you know, bring up states and actions based around non-greed, non-hatred, non-delusion. So that's nice to know, but like you said, that's all subjective. Like how, you know, how do we know in the moment what's a greedy action and what maybe has some greed wound into it, but also is important to follow an element of, you know? And so what's really important and gets passed up in the Kalama Sutta often is then, then the Buddha says, what's praised by the wise and not praised by the wise. So like, come to spiritual friends, talk things over, read these teachings. Like, people underestimate the power of right view. Um, and then a daily meditation practice, even of 10 minutes a day, often like that intuitive sense gets strengthened that way. And you'll know if you're clinging to something which is unwholesome over time. Like, it just becomes apparent and the, the, the heart has its own way of knowing things, but it needs a quiet space to, to operate in that knowing. And, and the final thing is, um, and often you can invoke, say, sort of, what would this person do? What would they say? And just see what answer comes out of the ether. And the final thing that gets passed up in the Kalama Sutta is exactly what you were mentioning, is, is loving kindness. The Buddha tells them to develop that. And I think that's because loving kindness is such a simple state. It's just so pure that it's like a mirror. Like when you're in that place of love, you can ask any question and the answer's often very simple and clear. And just having, really trying to cultivate a loving kindness and, and trusting that that brightening of the heart will clarify things a little bit. And, and the final thing though is to lean, you know, that's all about samadhi and panya concentration, developing these bright states, and then wisdom. But there's a real place for sila. Um, what external things in your life can you make a change in now? Like, are there people you know you should be spending less time with? Are there things you know you should give up doing? Is there some, you know, I, I remember when I was young, starting to try to meditate, and then I heard from my friend about one of his friends who was meditating you know, a certain number of, of, of minutes a day. And it's just something in me said, I, I need to do that. And so you just make the determination from that point, okay, I'm going to do that. So knowing that we don't always have the wisdom and agility of heart to make those decisions well, and trying to apply protective mechanisms when we're able to kind of shift external circumstances as well. So, you know, throwing out the, the beer or whatever, you, you don't have to worry about this, I don't think so. <laughs> so, does that help at all?